So at this point, you should be getting your notes out and taking down the title of the lesson, Evolution of Cells. You should also write down today's date, November 10th, 2020, as well as the fact that today is Unit 8, Day 2. By the end of today, you will be able to describe how cells evolved from anaerobic prokaryotes to eukaryotes. And the essential question, how did multicellular organisms evolve? That's a huge question, very broad. But we're going to start by discussing this origin story today. And before we move on, can someone remind me, what does the word anaerobic mean? What does this word mean here? Um, solar respiration while oxygen. Excellent. <clears throat> Excuse me. So anaerobic just means lacking oxygen, without oxygen, as Alicia said. So already, before we jump into the lesson, we should be thinking that life originally existed without oxygen. Now, look around, and almost all the life that we see and all of the life that we know of exists primarily because of oxygen and could not exist without it. So that was a huge evolutionary step, and it took place over the course of millions of years. We're not talking about centuries. We're not talking about millennia. We're talking about millions of years. Okay. Let's jump into this quick review kahoot. about classification. Um, I, some of my students in my third block yesterday experienced some difficulties with classification. I'm not sure if that's because they weren't paying attention during the lecture or if because maybe I sped through this a little bit. So we want to play this Kahoot just to give me a better idea of what you all understand about classification and what you still need some practice with. <clears throat> Uh, Ayana, you need to get your <laughs> computer fixed because we I am struggling to hear you. Can you say it one more time? Um, I was saying, what, what were you talking about? When? What you were just talking about, the classification. Are you talking about the assignment from yesterday? Yes, the assignment and just in general, um, you know, keeping in mind that Classification starts at something that's very general, the kingdom, and it moves more specifically. <clears throat> um, I'm sorry, very general with the domain. Excuse me. <clears throat> it starts with something that is very general, <clears throat> the domain, and it gets more and more specific. So kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So some of my students, I think, were struggling with that concept that we're, we're, we're moving through these levels and becoming more and more specific each time. So please do try to join this game in the next 30 seconds or so.
Okay, we'll go ahead and start now. Why do scientists organize living things into groups? Yeah, I think that question was maybe a bit uh, ambiguous. Perhaps you could have chosen a couple of answers, but I think that was the best one. Good job, Omari. I think you just kind of got kicked out of the chat, but good job, Malachi. Uh, and it's good to have you here with us today, and good job, Gabby. What is binomial nomenclature? Binomial nomenclature. Binomial. Great, so it's a naming system where organisms are given two part names. That's why we call it binomial. The prefix bi means two. The root word nomial is from the Latin nomen, which means name. Um, this is a cool table, I think, and this comes clearly from a textbook somewhere. But we can see that these two species, a bobcat and a lion, share much of the same classification all the way down to the family. But then when we get to the genus, and we start to see them diverge. So their genus, their geni, are different. For a bobcat, the genus is lynx. For a lion, the genus is panthera, or panthera. And then, of course, their species are different. Now, this, the way we write this, with the genus capitalized, the species not capitalized, in both words italicized, this is what we call the binomial nomenclature. It's the genus and the species. So instead of writing all seven or eight of their classifications, we simply write the genus and the species. We capitalize the genus and we italicize both words. This is called the scientific name. Okay, but it's cool that we can see here that they're, they've got five of the same classifications. Makes sense if they're both big cats. Good job, Stephanie and Malachi. A cat's scientific name is Felix Domesticus. Which genus does it belong to? Felix Domesticus. Ah, we struggle with this one. Okay, so as I was just saying in the last question, with our scientific names, and maybe I should send this to the chat, scientific names, and if you did the flip and flop activity yesterday, then this probably would have been a bit easier for you. But scientific names are written so that Venus comes first. In this case, we've got Felix and is followed by the species, in this case, Domesticus. Genus is capitalized, and the species is not. Big jump from Alicia. Malachi is still in the lead. What is taxonomy? Taxonomy.
Good. Everybody got that right. An organism's scientific name consists of <laughs> Oops, sorry. Scientific names are blank because they consist of two words. Good. Binomial is a word that means two words, two names. Ah, okay, Malachi, let's get back into it now. Good job, Gabby, Stephanie, and Alicia. The lowest hierarchy level in biological classification is the... Yes, so in this case, what they meant by lowest is specific, the most specific hierarchy level. Aw, a lot of people dropped that one. If two organisms are in the same phylum, they must also be in the same... Good. So in this case, we've got to keep in mind, we're moving from general to specific, more and more specific as we move down the hierarchy. So if we're saying that an organism is in the same phylum, that doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be in the same class or in the same order or in the same genus or family or species. But it does mean that they have to be in the same domain and they also have to be in the same kingdom. So let's take a look at this, just so we know what we're talking about. Mr. Rod? Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? Am I sounding a little bit better? Or is it still muffled sound? Uh, it's not great, but I can hear you. Is it still bad? That's better. Um, what does it mean by look for phylum? Whatever that is. Oh, phylum. What does it mean by yeah. phylum? So yeah. phylum is one of the levels of classification. So let's come over here for a second. Let me see this. It's before kingdom and after class. Yeah. All right. So actually, I don't really like this one that much because it's upside down. But kingdom is one of the more general levels of classification. The only level of classification that's more general than kingdom is domain, which is not written here. So in this case, as they move up, we're getting more specific. But so Humans, like you and I, we are homo sapiens. But there were other species of humans before there were only homo sapiens. If we go back 150,000 years, there were homo neanderthals, there were homo denisovans, uh, there were several other species of humans that went extinct for various reasons. Um, we are now the only remaining species uh, which means that we're the only 
species in this genus. But if we go up further, we are a part of the hominid family. The hominid family is made up of primates with relatively flat faces and 3D vision. So there are other species that are a part of the hominid family. If we go up even further, we are a part of the primate order, which are mammals with collarbones and grasping fingers. There are plenty of other families and genuses and or geni and species that are a part of the primate order. So as we kind of zoom out, we're including more and more organisms, more and more species under the umbrella. There are a lot of different mammals. There aren't as many primates. There aren't as many hominids. And there definitely aren't as many people or species in this genus, the homo genus. But when we compare it to, when we compare the class of mammals to the phylum of chordates, there are way more chordates than there are mammals. A mammal has to have some type of hair, some type of body hair, and it has to have mammary glands that produce milk for their, for their offspring. But a chordate just means any animal that has a backbone. So that's way more specific than that. That could be a reptile, that could be an amphibian. A lot of types of fish have backbones. Of course, none of those are mammals though. So again, what we're doing is we're getting more specific as we move from one level to the next. <clears throat> Excuse me. But the question asked, if I can go back to it, if two organisms are in the same phylum, then they must also be in the same blank. So if two organisms are both chordates, they're in the same phylum, do they both have to be mammals? Do they, does that mean that they have to be in the same class? No. We could be talking about a human being, which is a mammal, and we could be talking about a bald eagle, which is a bird. Okay, so they don't necessarily have to be in the same class, but if we're talking about a human being and a bird, and they're both chordates, of course they're both in the animal kingdom. They have to be in the same kingdom. That's what that question was asking. So anytime you say something is in the same blank, they must also be in the same, whatever levels are more general than that. <clears throat> Anytime you're talking about two organisms that are both primates, then both of those organisms are also mammals, they're also chordates, and they're also animals. Anytime you're talking about two organisms that are both hominids, then they also have to be primates, they also have to be mammals, chordates, and animals. I think I've belabored the point. Thank you for explaining that. You are welcome. Which is true of Dearest Magnus. Good. So this asks you to work backwards. We're given the species, Deerus magnus, and we have to kind of work backwards to figure out its traits. So obviously, Deerus magnus has a tail. This is in question set three. So then we have to look up to find the clue that tells us to go to question set three, which is right here. It has four legs. That told us to go to question set three. Having four legs is in question set two. So we need to now find the clue that told us to go to question set two. It has gr a green colored body. All right, so that's how you find the traits based on these dichotomous keys. Again, dichotomous keys prevent or provide you with two options. It says, if this, then, then do this. If this, then do this. Or if this, then your species is this. So you can work forwards. Let's say I had provided you a picture of this organism and it had a green colored body, four legs and didn't have a tail. Well, then I would say, oh, it's, it's a green colored body. So that's telling me to go to question set two. I look at question set two. It didn't have eight legs, which would be dearest octagus. It only had four legs. So that tells me to go to question set three. 
It didn't have a tail, so that's Dearest Magnus. You can also work backwards in that same way, though. What happened? I thought somebody got that right. Okay. Which organism is the youngest according to the phylogenetic tree? Youngest in terms of evolution a evolutionary age. Angel, good to have you here. And Castro. <clears throat> okay, so the, the, the organism with the shortest branch is going to be the youngest. So we could have had arm, armadillo or human. I don't know why it didn't count human. Um, I mean, I, I didn't count armadillo. But typically the organism that's going to be either furthest to the right or furthest to the left is going to be the youngest. And then between those two, whichever one of them has the shortest branch. So we can see sharks have a really long branch. They're very evolutionarily old. They've been on, on the planet for a long time. Humans are much younger. Wonderful. <clears throat> Good job, folks. Okay. Back to the interesting stuff. That's interesting. Taxonomy is interesting too, but it's not my favorite. So please do write this down. Earth started out as a hot primordial soup consisting of very little oxygen and lots of carbon dioxide. Now, when we say very little oxygen, we're not talking about standing at the top of Mount Everest and struggling to breathe. We're talking about there literally not being oxygen for your cells to, to do cellular respiration. There's, there is basically no oxygen. But the atmosphere was filled with carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide, which of course contributed to the planet being hot, just like carbon dioxide today is contributing to the planet growing hotter. That carbon dioxide is trapping energy from the sun um, and warming the planet. Millions of years ago, so much of it existed that Earth looked like this. It was a molten place. It was a rock planet um, that was covered by water for the most part. Uh, the atmosphere, atmosphere would have been very steamy, filled with carbon dioxide. There was no life anywhere on the, on the land. And originally, originally, the only life that existed were single-celled organisms. Single-celled organisms that did not rely on any oxygen to survive. We might now speculate that they survived on sulfur. Um, which is very chemically similar to oxygen, but sulfur is emitted from uh, underwater volcanoes. And we have now, we do have evidence now that there are, even to this day, life forms that exist near underwater volcanoes at the bottom of the ocean. They exist on sulfur. So perhaps uh, the earliest forms of life were similar, but they didn't have oxygen. So we can just imagine this barren place nothing alive on land, very little alive underwater. Most of the planet was water, even more so than it is today. How on earth do we know this from 4.5 billion years ago? What do you all think? What are your ideas about how we know this, or know this information? Rocks. What do you mean, Gabby, that you're on the right track? Did they study like ancient fossils and I don't know, really, I guess, I don't know what she said, you know, rock. They studied like different rock layers. Yeah, so 
No, we got to be careful. We're not talking. We yes, fossils can get us some of the way back. You know, we can get back some some of the time, but not 4.5 billion years. There are not 4.5 billion year old fossils. Um, but there are 4.5 billion year old rocks um, that are very far, you know, they've been supplanted under the surface of the earth, but we can still uh, extract them for scientific purposes. And the chemistry of those rocks tells us clues about what the planet was like. Castro? A meteor? And we can look at, uh, yeah, different meteoric rocks as well. Um, that have been deposited in different places on the earth. Um, we can see also even meteors that exist in space. We can study, some of them carry water, frozen water, ice, but we can see what exists in that ice. We can see uh, some of the, you know, some of the chemistry in that ice. And we can speculate that that's a similar type of environment that would have um, provided water to the early earth. So, uh, it's really like a forensic analysis of, you know, 4.5 billion year old rock, as Gabby said. Writing's not that easy, but Grammarly can help. This sentence is grammatically correct, but it's wordy and hard to read. It undermines the writer's message and the word choice is bland. Grammarly's cutting edge technology helps you craft compelling, understandable writing that makes an impact on your reader. Much better. Are you ready to give it a try? Installation is so Billions of years ago, on the young planet Earth, simple organic compounds assembled into more complex coalitions that could grow and reproduce. They were the very first life on Earth, and they gave rise to every one of the billions of species that have inhabited our planet since. At the time, Earth was almost completely devoid of what we'd recognize as a suitable environment for living things. The young planet had widespread volcanic activity and an atmosphere that created hostile conditions. So where on Earth could life begin? To begin the search for the cradle of life, it's important to first understand the basic necessities for any life form. Elements and compounds essential to life include hydrogen, methane, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, phosphates, and ammonia. In order for these ingredients to co-mingle and react with each other, they need a liquid solvent, water. And in order to grow and reproduce, all life needs a source of energy. Life forms are divided into two camps, autotrophs, like plants, that generate their own energy, and heterotrophs, like animals, that consume other organisms for energy. The first life form wouldn't have had other organisms to consume, of course, so it must have been an autotroph, generating energy either from the sun or from chemical gradients. So what locations meet these criteria? Places on land or close to the surface of the ocean have the advantage of access to sunlight. But at the time when life began, the UV radiation on Earth's surface was likely too harsh for life to survive there. One setting offers protection from this radiation and an alternative energy source. The hydrothermal vents that wind across the ocean floor, covered by kilometers of seawater and bathed in complete darkness. 
A hydrothermal vent is a fissure in the Earth's crust where seawater seeps into magma chambers and is ejected back out at high temperatures, along with a rich slurry of minerals and simple chemical compounds. Energy is particularly concentrated at the steep chemical gradients of hydrothermal vents. There's another line of evidence that points to hydrothermal vents, the last universal common ancestor of life, or LUCA for short. LUCA wasn't the first life form, but it's as far back as we can trace. Even so, we don't actually know what LUCA looked like. There's no LUCA fossil, no modern day LUCA still around. Instead, scientists identified genes that are commonly found in species across all three domains of life that exist today. Since these genes are shared across species and domains, they must have been inherited from a common ancestor. These shared genes tell us that LUCA lived in a hot, oxygen-free place and harvested energy from a chemical gradient, like the ones at hydrothermal vents. There are two kinds of hydrothermal vent, black smokers and white smokers. Black smokers release acidic, carbon dioxide-rich water heated to hundreds of degrees Celsius and packed with sulfur, iron, copper, and other metals essential to life. But scientists now believe that black smokers were too hot for LUCA, so now the top candidates for the cradle of life are white smokers. Among the white smokers, a field of hydrothermal vents on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge called Lost City has become the most favored candidate for the cradle of life. The seawater expelled here is highly alkaline and lacks carbon dioxide, but is rich in methane and offers more hospitable temperatures. Adjacent black smokers may have contributed the carbon dioxide necessary for life to evolve at Lost City giving it all the components to support the first organisms that radiated into the incredible diversity of life on Earth today. Did you know that a single-celled organism caused the first mass extinction? Check out this animation about how it almost wiped out life on Earth and paved the way for complex life. Okay, <clears throat> fascinating stuff. Did you ask me? Now, the other way we know this is that we've followed the scientific method, and specifically two scientists named Miller and Ure set up an experiment to model the conditions of early Earth. They did this quite successfully. Uh, their experiment showed that the conditions of early Earth were capable of producing amino acids. Um, just as a quick, quick review question, what do amino acids build? Make protein. They make proteins. Thank you, Gabby. Um, but we also know that amino acids are the A's and the T's and the C's and the G's and the U's that make what? DNA and RNA. Excellent. So they make the nucleic acids as well. Uh, that's not something that we've talked. Well, we didn't. We didn't. We did specify, but it's been a while. So those same amino acids are also responsible for at least one part of those nucleotides that make nucleic acids. So those amino acids are so important. Of course, there are only twenty of them, but they can lead to huge combinations of proteins, and uh, of course, they can also be uh, incorporated into RNA and DNA, as Castro said. So there we have it. That's the beginning. Those are the necessary building blocks for life. More complicated things come as time goes on, as many million, millions and billions of years go on. But that alone demonstrates that life was possible. We could get biotic organisms from abiotic conditions. We could produce life where there was originally no life. All we needed was water, simple gases, and some type of electri electricity. In the early atmosphere, that electricity was produced by lightning from these methane clouds. Okay, so this is a fascinating experiment. And uh, 
I believe they won a Nobel Prize for it. Let's watch this video. Hey guys, what's up? So I am super into this website right now, Generation Genius, and they cover all the science standards. Stated clearly presents, what was the Miller-Urey experiment? It was once believed that if you left food out to rot, living creatures like maggots and even rats would simply poof into existence. The idea was called spontaneous generation. A series of experiments starting in the 1600s disproved this idea, and in the 1800s, a new scientific law was proposed. Life only comes from life. It's true that rats, maggots, and even microbes are far too complex to simply poof into existence, but in 1859, English naturalist Charles Darwin put forth the theory of evolution. In it, he showed that under the right circumstances, relatively simple creatures can gradually give rise to more complex creatures. Given this information, serious thinkers began to wonder, is it possible that simple life forms actually could come from non-living matter, not by poofing into existence, but through a natural gradual process similar to what we see in biological evolution. Darwin himself mentioned this idea when writing to a friend. But if, and oh what a big if, he wrote, we could conceive in some warm little pond with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salts, light, heat, electricity, and so on present, that a protein compound was chemically formed, ready to undergo still more complex changes. In 1924, Russian biochemist Alexander Oparin published a book which he titled The Origin of Life. In it, he outlined his thoughts on a gradual progression from simple chemistry to living cells. He imagined the early ocean as a primordial soup, a rich collection of complex molecules produced by natural chemical reactions. In this soup, further reactions could take place, eventually producing living cells. At the time, Darwin's warm little pond and Oparin's primordial soup were really just speculation. They were founded on a good understanding of chemistry and biology, but they could not be considered legitimate scientific hypotheses because no one had found a way to test or observe them. Science, after all, is the study of observable facts and an ongoing conversation about how those facts can be best linked together. Chemical reactions like those proposed by Darwin and Oparin are not expected to leave an observable fossil record. Without either having fossils to examine or a time machine to travel back and observe what happened, how could scientists even begin to study the origin of life? In the 1950s, Stanley Miller, then a graduate student at the University of Chicago, came up with an idea. We could simulate early Earth conditions in the lab and then carefully watch what happens. If you can't study fish in the sea, set up an aquarium. Working with his professor, Harold Urey, Miller designed an apparatus to simulate the ancient water cycle. Together they put in water to model the ancient ocean. It was gently boiled to mimic evaporation. Along with water vapor, for gases of the atmosphere they chose methane, hydrogen, and ammonia. These are simple gases which scientists at the time thought were probably abundant on the ancient Earth. They added a condenser to cool the atmosphere, allowing water molecules to form drops and fall back into their ocean like rain. The ancient Earth would have had many sources of energy, sunlight, geothermal heat, and even thunderstorms, so they added sparks to the atmosphere to simulate lightning. The goal of the experiment was not to create life, but to simply test the first step in Oparin's model. Can simple chemistry naturally give rise to the complex molecules of life? After running the experiment for just one week, their ocean became brownish black. Careful analysis revealed that through a series of reactions, many complex molecules had been produced. Among these were amino acids, special molecules of life that we once thought could only be built inside the bodies of living creatures. This was a pivotal breakthrough in science, so significant in fact, that it gave rise to an entirely new field of research now known as prebiotic chemistry. 
Scientists don't know for sure if the gases used by Miller really were the most common gases of the ancient Earth. Because of this, many experiments have since been done, showing that the molecules of life can form in a wide variety of environments with different starting chemicals and different sources of energy. Sugars, lipids, and amino acids have even been found on meteorites. This suggests that the molecules of life formed all throughout the ancient solar system and may be forming right now in other regions of our galaxy. Together, these discoveries tell us that Oparin's primordial soup and Darwin's warm little pond could have easily existed in one way or another on our ancient planet. So to sum things up, what was the Miller-Urey experiment? The Miller-Urey experiment was our first attempt at simulating ancient Earth conditions, in this case, the ancient Earth's water cycle, for the purpose of testing ideas about the origin of life. The Miller-Urey experiment is significant for two main reasons. First, though it was not a perfect simulation of the early Earth, it clearly demonstrated for the first time that biomolecules can form under ancient Earth-like conditions. Second, the experiment took what was once mere speculation, the idea that life may have emerged from chemistry, and transformed a portion of that speculation into legitimate, testable science. Many questions remain to be answered about the origin of life, but scientists from many nations and many fields of study are now following Stanley Miller's lead. They're finding ways to turn those questions about the origin of life into testable scientific hypotheses. Simulation experiments cannot tell us exactly how life formed in the past, but if enough of them are done, they could eventually tell us if it's possible for life to emerge from chemistry. I'm John Perry, and that's the Miller-Urey experiment stated clearly. You're on mute. Wow. I was talking for a long time. Thank you. Thank you, Jalen. Thank you, Castro. So let's go back. We start off with these heterotrophic anaerobic prokaryotes. 
We say heterotrophic in this case because not that they're eating plants or eating other animals, but they are um, eating organic molecules, essentially. They're, they're, they're absorbing other organic molecules, um, larger macromolecules. They are anaerobic because, as Alicia said, they do not use oxygen. And they're prokaryotes because they do not have a nucleus, nor do they have any other membrane-bound organelles like chloroplasts or mitochondria or vacuoles. They are very, very simple organisms, single-celled organisms. Eventually, some of them develop the ability to do photosynthesis. <clears throat> and this ability to do photosynthesis essentially just uses light from the sun um, to excite an electron. Uh, and once that electron has been excited, we can use that to make ATP. Once ATP has been made, we can use that ATP to make glucose. And then, of course, we can use glucose to make even more ATP. So it's kind of like investing in yourself. <clears throat> As a result of all this photosynthesis taking place, the atmosphere starts to be filled up um, with oxygen. That's going to be important soon. But keep in mind, originally, the atmosphere is basically just carbon dioxide, which, of course, is needed for photosynthesis. This allowed photosynthetic autotrophic prokaryotes to evolve so that they can make their own food. That's what autotrophic means, to make their own food. As they start making their own food, they're releasing oxygen. So keep in mind, just, just think about the scale of time that would have been required for all of this to happen. And for these organisms to release enough oxygen into the atmosphere to make the earth what it is today, where there are many, many millions and billions of tons of oxygen in our atmosphere. Just think about the scale of time that that would have required if this only produces six molecules of oxygen, which weigh I can't even describe to you how little that weighs, six molecules of oxygen. Um, so the scale of time and the scale, the amount of cells that would have been needed to, to produce billions of tons of oxygen into the atmosphere is hard to imagine, but we're talking about about a billion years. So this is when we start to create eukaryotes because one cell basically absorbs another one. And the cell that gets absorbed becomes an organelle now. It no longer is free existing. It, it lives inside of another cell. So it evolves and eventually becomes a mitochondria. And then another one evolves and eventually becomes a chloroplast. So now we've got this one cell that, because it absorbed the others, is much more complicated. And it has a degree of what we call compartmentalization. It has different things inside of it that are responsible for different jobs. So instead of the whole cell having to do everything for itself, well, now I have this smaller cell inside of me that can do that job. And I have another smaller cell inside of me that can do another job. I don't have to do it all by myself. That's the process of cell specialization. It's they start to develop specific jobs. And now we have multicellular organisms. So again, the scale of time it's hard to imagine because it's billions of years. You know, the Earth is uh, estimated at about 4.5 billion years old. Well, 6 billion years old. Let's see, age of the Earth. It's 6 billion. Oh, 4.543 billion years old. Plus or minus 50 million years, no big deal. The universe is six billion years old. That's what it is. No, I thought the universe was 13.8 billion years old. You're correct. Wow, good job. So what if I get six billion? I'm not sure. Um, but yes, the universe is 13.8. Good job. Okay. 
So there are two asynchronous assignments today. We have run over a little bit because I like to talk. <clears throat> I'll focus on the evolution of cells, reading, and questions assignment first, please, because I'm still working on some adjustments to the other assignment, the most missed questions assignment. Um, so go ahead and knock out that reading section. Uh, you'll just have to read a you know a paragraph or so and then answer questions based on that.
Okay, folks, it's 1137. So I appreciate you being here. I appreciate you staying. Uh, hopefully this was an intriguing lesson and I will talk to you all on Thursday. No school tomorrow. So you get an extra day to take care of these asynchronous assignments.